Anya, on behalf on behalf of NPPA, welcome you all for the keynote address. So the speaker for this session is Dr. Cortland. So Dr. Cortland is interested in exploring the interface between the body, mind, and the brain, and especially in the question of how various forms of meditation can help us to cultivate positive qualities like mindfulness, compassion, and resilience. His current work focuses on studying the psychological and neural mechanisms of different families of meditation practice. He's also the creator of Healthy Minds program, a well-being training program that integrates the insights from scientific research with a comprehensive path of contemplative training. He's the chief contemplative officer at Healthy Minds Innovations and co-founder and executive director of Tegel International, a global network of meditation groups and centers. We welcome you, Prof uh, Professor Cortland. And uh, this session will be chaired by Dr. Shalini Dugul. Uh, a brief uh, bio about her. Dr. Shalini Dugul has completed her PhD in psychology from IIT Delhi in 2009 and is currently working with Birla Soft as director in learning and development. And alumni of uh, Lady Sridham College for Women, she has been working across sectors and industries in the space of LND or organization development in the last uh, for the past 20 years. Her areas of interest include positive and cultural psychology. She has led many organizational wide uh, interventions related to coaching, psychometric assessments, role and competency mapping and skill building in her career. Her focus remains on how she can strengthen personal resources for employees, including happiness, optimism, resilience, and apart from only just apart from focusing on the role related to skills and competencies. We welcome you, Dr. Shalini, and I would request you to take over. Uh, thanks, Anya. Thank you for uh, my, you know, introducing me to the group. Uh, so, uh, welcome, Dr. Kotlet Dal, and it's a pleasure uh, to be here, uh, you know, in the session with you. Thanks for taking out time to address the participants of the NPPA conference. Uh, Sanya has already introduced you, so I won't spend uh, too much time there. But it's really fascinating the work uh, that you do and to read about your background including a little snippet I read <clears throat> where you spent uh, a number of years uh, in Asia studying uh, you know, and practicing meditation, including eight years uh, with uh, you know, Tibetan refugee settlements in uh, Asia, in India and Nepal. So that's uh, really intriguing. Um, uh, it was also really interesting to read about the mission of uh, Healthy Minds Innovation, and, you know, which is to translate science into tools to cultivate and measure well-being and really make it easy and accessible as a concept and as a practice for people. Uh, so really, uh, you know, uh, fascinating work that you're doing there. Uh, in today's talk, um, Dr. Dal, you, you know, uh, from, uh, um, you know, as the group knows, you'll be focusing on the linkage between meditation and its implications on uh, our overall physical and mental health, and also on our success in our work and our relationships. I'm really keen uh, to hear more and learn more about your work. So over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you all. And uh, as Dr. Dugal just mentioned, I have uh, I've spent quite a bit of time in India. I was actually just there a few months ago in Dharamsala. And uh, I spent probably about maybe two to three years in India, mainly in West Bengal and uh, Bihar. So I have... Uh, Spent a lot of time there, and uh, it's been a huge part of my personal journey. So it's it's wonderful to spend this time with you. And I'm going to go ahead and share my slide deck here, so we can start the presentation. Can you see that? Okay. Wonderful. It's, All right. It's going up. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so as as was just mentioned, uh, the work that we do at the Center for Healthy Minds, which is uh, an interdisciplinary research center at uh, the University of Wisconsin here in Madison, is really focused on well-being and the neuroscience of emotion. And specifically, what we're fo focused on these days is the cultivation of well-being, which is how can we actually train ourselves to experience more well-being. And I'll talk a bit about that today, and specifically this, this framework that we've developed and published a few years ago 
that lays out a model for well-being and how it can be trained. So that's really going to be the, the focus of the topic today. And as you'll hear, practices like meditation, things that you know are uh, in many ways ancient practices that it, in particular in, uh, in Indian culture go back thousands of years, but you find in other cultures and traditions as well. So science is just beginning to, uh, to learn about and study some of these very ancient practices. So first, a bit of context. Well-being is really at a, a crisis level if you look at the scientific data. Mental health has been steadily declining by many markers for decades, and most of these markers have accelerated under uh, or during the pandemic. So if you look at things like rates of depression, rates of anxiety, rates of uh, attention-related disorders like ADHD, and a whole range of different mental health concerns, they've really been steadily uh, increasing over the past few decades. And as I said, during the pandemic, that this just accelerated even more. So much so that we really feel that this is on par with climate change as a global crisis that we really have to grapple with. Um, and it's particularly what's particularly concerning about this is that our kids are the ones who seem to be hit hardest so a lot of these mental health uh, statistics, especially depression, anxiety, and things like that, you start to see with young children and teenagers, and especially with teenage girls, it's the, the numbers are just really, really, really concerning. So we do research on these kinds of things, and we kind of view ourselves almost as scientist activists in the way that climate scientists started you know, thinking that it wasn't enough just to do their research, they needed to get out and, and ring the bell, ring the alarms, so people could better understand not only the, the scale of the problem, but also what we can do about it. And the good news is that there are some very practical solutions to these challenges we all face. So a lot of our research and what I'm going to talk about today is based on a very simple idea, which you can see here, is this idea that well-being is best thought of as a skill, which is to say it's not something you are born with. There is certainly a genetic influence on well-being, nor is it something that's purely due to our environment and the conditions we find ourselves in, although that too is an influence. It is also very much something that we can learn, we can practice, and we can apply in our day-to-day -day lives in very simple yet powerful ways. So this idea is not only uh, you know, a psychological principle, but it's something that is deeply rooted in our biology and even in the, the wiring of our brains. So many of you have probably heard about the, the principle of neuroplasticity, which is simply the idea that the brain responds and changes in response to experience. So we, in many ways, are built to learn and transform from our brain to even the expression of our genetic structure. There's a whole new field called epigenetics that basically shows that our, our biology is a dynamic process that is constantly learning and adapting. So well-being is really no exception to that, that this is something that can be shaped and influenced by all these forces in our lives, sometimes without our even knowing, but it also is something that we can actively take a role in. We can make active choices to train our minds that make a, a very substantial difference, not only in how we feel, but even in the structure and functioning of our brain or how our, our genes are expressing themselves in response to stress and so on. So the science here is really quite robust at this point uh, in this area. So the framework that I'm going to talk about, uh, we published a number of years ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Uh, and it uh, it kind of lays out four of these main ideas that um, or four areas that are the best targets for training, which is to say that these are the if you think about training well being and you ask well what is it that we do how should we go about doing that the framework that we created lays out the scientific empirical basis for the best candidates really for trainability when it comes to well being. And I should say that while this is very much rooted in uh, cutting edge empirical science, 
This is equally drawn on the world's wisdom traditions, uh, in particular, some of the traditions coming out of India, where there are, you know, there's just a wealth of knowledge and understanding about how we can train our minds to flourish. So it's both a, a fusion, you could say, of contemplative or wisdom and meditative perspectives with modern science. So what are these four? I'm going to get into each of these one by one, but simply put, these the four are awareness, connection, insight, and purpose. And you'll see that there are, there are things we can do, the skills listed in the bottom, that are the, the aspects that we can engage in that allow us to strengthen these pillars of well-being. So when we train things like mindfulness, as you do in many forms of meditation, that, for example, will strengthen our capacity to be fully present and aware. Similarly, training in compassion. I was just in Dharamsala a few months ago, as I mentioned, spending some time with the Dalai Lama on some projects uh, we've been working on with him. And he, for example, is a great exemplar of somebody who has spent a lifetime cultivating compassion. Not just, you know, maybe he was born an extraordinary being, but regardless of how he was born, it's clear that he spends hours every day cultivating compassion through his meditation practice, as I'm sure some of you do as well. So uh, similarly, we have insight, which in traditional perspectives would be associated with wisdom, which is not just being smart. It's not just having theoretical knowledge, but deep experiential knowledge of the mind and how it works, and in particular of one's own mind and how it works. So we're not just, we don't just get the human condition, but we can see in the moment how our thoughts, our emotions, and so on are shaping experience. And finally, uh, the fourth of these four pillars is purpose. And this one, there is a, a mountain of scientific data showing that feeling a sense of purpose and meaning in one's life is vital for not only mental health, but also physical health and can even impact things like our recovery from surgery. So it's the, the data on this is particularly uh, powerful. So let's dive in here and talk about the first of these. So awareness, simply put, is just the quality of being able to be fully aware of what's going on within oneself and around oneself in the present moment. Simply put, just being fully in the here and now versus being distracted or on autopilot. So even right now, as you're listening to me, you probably have many things pulling on your attention. You might have emails coming in, or your phone is vibrating, or just the normal sounds and sensory experiences in your environment. And if you just consciously choose to pay attention, you consciously choose to notice those distractions, but to stay with your chosen activity, which is hopefully listening to me right now, that is essentially training this skill. Unfortunately, in this day and age, we've basically created an entire culture and economy to create distraction. And there's been some really interesting research on this and the role, the impact it can have, it can have on our, on our well-being. So awareness, and this is summarizing uh, a lot of research across different fields, but awareness in particular, if you have to say, uh, pick on one thing that highlights why this is so important for well-being, it is because awareness is critical for self-regulation. As you can see here, it helps us to notice and manage our thoughts and emotions. It helps us to see when we're having a reaction or say we have an impulse to do something healthy, we can actually notice that versus being carried away before we even notice what's happened. And because of that, it helps us to build and maintain healthy habits and to let go of unhealthy habits. So all of these things that are listed here rest on our ability to regulate our thoughts, emotions, and impulses. And awareness is one of the key cornerstones, the foundation for that kind of self-regulation. And as I mentioned a moment ago, unfortunately, we are getting more and more distracted and consequently less and less aware, primarily through our devices, technology, social media, all these things that we've created as a species. So just out of curiosity, and you can put this in the chat if you like, how much do you had to guess, and maybe some of you have seen this research, if you know the answer, then maybe don't mention it right now, 
But if you just had to guess, how much of the day would you say the typical person is distracted? What do you think? Maybe you can just put in the chat. Anybody want to take a guess at that? So even if you don't put something in the chat, you can just guess in your own mind. The research, and this is coming out of a team in Harvard, showed that we are distracted 47% of the time. And this research was done probably 15 years ago or so. It was published in 2010, which means they were probably collecting data a few years before that. That is exactly the time the first Apple iPhone hit the market. So that is... So this data, this statistic right here, likely has, has, if they did the same study today, my guess is it would be even worse. So think about the implications of that. That means if you are like the average person, roughly half of your life, half of your waking life, when you are with your family and the people you really care about, you're not paying attention to them. Perhaps even more depressing, they are not paying attention to you half of the time. That means half of the time you're working and trying to get important work done, you're distracted. That means just during mundane routines, half of the time you're not fully present with what you're doing and who you're with. So the cost of this is enormous when you consider our productivity, our relationships, virtually everything in our life is, is influenced by this very simple fact that we get distracted very, very easily. And when you train this, however, we, despite the fact that we're all quite distracted these days, when you take the time to train this skill and you train yourself to be more present and less distracted, it has a profound effect. And even so much as something biological like the pain network in the brain. So this is a research, this is some research we did at the Center for Healthy Minds that took a group of very, very advanced meditators and compared them to people who had never meditated before. And we were just asking a simple question. Does having done years of meditation practice change the way the brain responds to physical pain? So imagine yourself lying in a big brain scanner in, the, in an fMRI, and you have something on your wrist that pipes in hot water that is extremely hot, just hot enough um, very hot enough to create a lot of pain, but not so hot that it damages your skin. So it really hurts. I actually have done this myself, and I can tell you it, it really, really hurts. So you have this water coming in every, uh, every minute or so, and usually what happens is there's a sound. So a sound plays, and after a few minutes, after doing this a few times, you realize that when the sound plays, that means the hot water is going to be piped in in about 10 seconds. So in the non-meditator, something very interesting happens. As soon as the sound plays and they start to pair the sound with the experience that's going to happen in a few seconds, the pain network activates. And then the pain actually happens 10 seconds later, and then it ends, and there's this very slow recovery to baseline. So you can see here that the pain network in the brain activates even before the pain happens. So if you didn't know what this person was experiencing and you just let their brain and you looked at the pain matrix, it would be very hard to tell when the pain actually started. So it's almost as though the brain is simulating the pain before it happens and then it happens. And of course the pain matrix is active then. And then well after the pain, it's still simulating that pain. So it's almost like the, the reverberations of that are still happening in the brain. The meditators, however, had this experience. So the exact same protocol, they still have the sound playing, they still have that hot water piped in, but the pain matrix does not activate before the pain occurs. Instead, it's just a, sort of the normal baseline activity. And then when the pain happens, Interestingly, it's not that they experience the pain less. In fact, in some regions, they experience the pain even more acutely. So it's not as though the meditators were tuning out the pain. They actually were intensely attuned to the pain. But then right after the pain ends, straight back to baseline. So if you can imagine how you would translate a finding like this into our real life, imagine you have like a really stressful meeting at work. 
Often what happens is that we are rehearsing that stressful event long before it happens. You might be thinking about it a few days before you have that difficult meeting and your mind is already thinking about it. You might be experiencing the same emotions. What's happening is the networks in your brain that are likely to activate during the meeting are activating before the meeting. And you're having the same physical stress response. Your brain is behaving in the same way. Your body's physical uh, stress hormones like cortisol are probably being released. And then you might have the meeting, whatever that is, and you might have, it might actually be a stressful meeting. And then again, it stays with you. Maybe later that night, you're lying in bed and you're still thinking about it, right? You're just replaying that stressful event. It might disrupt your sleep. Your body is stressed. Your brain is, these networks in your brain are becoming active. So this is showing that essentially we can train our brain to be more resilient. We can train ourselves so we don't have that anticipation of all and stress experiences, nor do we need to have the reverberation, kind of the, the hangover of all these difficult experiences. The other thing that was interesting about this particular study, this was what I just showed you and told you was all about the brain, is we also just asked them to rate their experience on a few different scales. We asked them how unpleasant was the pain that you just experienced? And then we asked how intense was the pain you experienced? When it comes to the intensity, the meditators and the non-meditators were pretty much the same. They were equally rating the intensity of, of the pain as it was happening. But the unpleasantness of the pain was very different. The meditators met uh, or rated the painful experience as much less unpleasant. So what this shows, both at the brain level and at the subjective experiential level, is that we can disentangle pain from suffering. We can actually have pain, and we usually think these are one and the same thing, but we can experience physical pain without nearly as much suffering. Or similarly, we could experience an emotional stressor, like a stressful experience, like a stressful meeting or an argument, something emotionally painful, but without all of the surrounding emotional suffering that oftentimes comes with it. So that's awareness, the first of these four others. There's a lot more to say, but just a summary of a little bit of the science in that area. The second of the pillars is connection. So we have awareness and then connection. So here, as you might imagine, this is all about our capacity to not be physically connected, in the sense of being around other people, but to feel connected. There's a lot of very interesting research here too that shows that it, although it is important how many relationships we have, how many people we meet, and how you know how much we interact with others, the most important thing from for our well-being is is how we feel about all of that. Do we actually feel connected? Do we feel assured? Do we feel that we have the resources to care for others? Those are the most helpful or important qualities for well-being. So similarly. Um, the our sense of connectedness is vitally important for well-being and you can see here uh, just a few of the basic statistics one of the most startling things about connection is that connection and how connected we feel you know whether we feel connected to the people in our lives or we feel lonely and isolated is not only vitally important for our mental health and psychological well-being it is as important a risk factor for physical health as smoking. And it's more of a risk factor than things like obesity, diet, exercise. So basically, if you are feeling lonely, it's, it's as toxic for your physical health as smoking is. And that's striking for a few reasons. One is that, at least in the US here, Doctors will never ask you about that. They might ask you if you smoke. They might ask you if you're exercising or how your diet is. These days, if they're kind of cutting edge, they might ask you about your sleep. But actually, our relationships and how we feel about them are at the top of the list for our physical health. But in a lot of the world's healthcare systems, this is not even on the map, despite the fact that there's pretty overwhelming scientific data about this. So again, like awareness, the good news is 
that although our genes and our environment will shape our sense of connection, these are also things that we can train. And we have basic functions in our biology that allow for this. So if you look at babies, you'll see that we have some innate capacities that we are born with. Here, you can see in this short, in this one picture, that empathy is something that is wired into our brain. So we don't know which of these babies was crying first, but this is what we do as humans. When somebody is angry or they're joyful or they're sad, we can sense their emotional state. And it's almost as though we kind of vibrate at that same frequency, like these two babies. Unfortunately, we also develop this pretty early on. Sometimes we can sense another person's emotions, but we learn to tune it out. And this is, you could say, the experience of apathy. And in particular, the most obvious example of this is just reading the news or watching the news where there can be so much tragedy, so much suffering, but it's so painful to let all that in. We basically learn to just not let it affect us at an emotional level. We become apathetic about the suffering of others. And again, really interesting research here, you know, about when the, when the people who are suffering, when we we witness suffering when we perceive them to be distant from us, when we perceive, perceive them to be different from us, we experience uh, greater degrees of apathy and disconnection. We also, however, have this capacity, which is different from both empathy and apathy, and this is compassion. So you can see here that one baby's crying, the other baby clearly recognizes that the baby is crying, but the response is to care. It's not that they are just crying themselves. They notice the crying and they want to help. They're concerned. And this is just such a beautiful image that shows that this is a response we are born with from a very, very young age. We have this capacity. So compassion from a scientific perspective is, as you can read here, it's the feeling that we have that arises when we witness another person suffering and that we have the motivation to actually help. So it's not just a feeling state, it is a motivational state. And in our research, we show that actually you find this even in the, in the brain, you find this in the motor cortex of the brain. So the parts of the brains that motivate physical movement become active in compassion. So it's almost as though we're ready and willing to jump in and help. And interestingly, these networks for empathy and compassion are completely different in the brain. We tend to think of empathy and compassion as very similar, but if you think of empathy as simply the feeling another of what another one feels, and compassion is that impulse to help, that actually these are completely different networks in the brain. So again, you can strengthen these, and you can see here that there is a range of benefits to taking the time to cultivate compassion and appreciation and kindness, this ability to care. So it not only just makes us feel better, it not only puts us in the position so we can help others, it has a physiological, biological response. It of course changes our mental and emotional state and even can change our behavior. We've done some really interesting research showing that for example, it'll make people more willing to spend money to help other people if you do simple trainings like this. So that is the third. We have awareness, we have connection, and now we have insight. And I realize I'm running a little late, so I'm gonna speed this up a bit. So insight, as I mentioned earlier, is our capacity to recognize how our thoughts, emotions, and per perceptions can shape our experience. And in particular here, how all of these experiences shape our sense of self, most importantly. And this is important because our sense of self plays a critically important in our mental health and well-being. So you can see that when we have a distorted self-image or an unhealthy self-image, it affects us on all of these different levels. It can affect how we age, for example, by affecting the length of our telomeres all the way to the way our emotional centers in our brains become active in different experiences. And of course, we all know firsthand that this can affect just how we feel, our mental health and our mental and emotional state. So just one really interesting uh, example 
of how insight can help us in real world, world situations is just this very human experience of disagreeing with other people who see the world differently than we do. Right now in the US, I don't know how it is in India these days, but we have this just terribly divided political landscape where it's almost like people can't even talk to each other. And what is going on in these moments, if you look at the neuroscience in this area, is that when we argue and we get stuck in our own strong beliefs and we argue with somebody else, our brain is literally not listening anymore. The sensory parts of our brain that are taking in information, like whatever the person might be saying, or taking in the visual cues, like you know, seeing if their their facial expression and so forth, our brain literally stops processing that in the same way. And what happens is regions of our brain associated with thoughts and emotions are just kind of looping back and forth. And basically, what happens is, although we like to think that we're very rational, we usually just have a strong feeling. We, we kind of ignore the evidence. We cherry pick the evidence that supports how we think and feel. We ignore the evidence that doesn't. And we essentially then lose the ability to, um, to communicate with others in a healthy way. And we just basically are talking to ourselves. So when you see two people arguing, they're actually not even talking to each other. Their brains are literally in their own little loops where they're almost talking to, to themselves, but just in the same room together. And what we can see is that, again, you can train yourself to, to experience these things differently. You can uh, essentially learn to ask yourself questions. And in, a, in fact, a lot of the insight practices we have is the art of asking good questions. So for example, when you find yourself really stressed out, or you find yourself about to get into an argument and react to somebody, you can just ask yourself, you know, what am I not seeing here? What what is their perspective here? What If I were in their position with their life and their experience, how would I see this question or this situation or this, this view or topic, whatever it might be? So just the ability to step back and ask a question can be hugely powerful. And as you can see, it opens the mind to new information and perspectives. It literally will change the way the brain is functioning in the moment. And in turn, that makes us more flexible more adaptable and more resilient. So again, insight in this way is just a skill, the ability to really ask questions and to examine one's own beliefs, thoughts, and emotions. So that's insight. Awareness was first, connection, and then insight. And then fourth, finally, we have purpose. And this is just simply put the ability to feel that one's life and pursuits are meaningful and linked to a purpose beyond oneself. So as we can see here, this is not only important for well-being, but even physical health. So this is the actual hazard of dying. This is data on mortality in later stages of life. And you can see that people who have a higher purpose in life uh, are much, much less likely to die than people who have a low sense of purpose in life. So even this very simple question of our mortality as a species is linked to how strongly or weakly we feel a sense of purpose. As a skill, this is something we can practice and improve by first taking the time to clarify what our most important values and guiding principles are. We then can apply them in our lives, even to simple things like doing the dishes or you know, going for a walk or having a chat with a friend just applying our principles and, and values and linking them to the, these motivations that are nourishing to us. And then we extend that to other areas of our lives, even to challenges when we're getting stressed out or major life challenges like the loss of a loved one or the loss of a job and so on. We essentially can learn to see those through the lens of our core values and principles. And that then has a huge impact on our well being. And I love to show this quote from the Dalai Lama, one of your famous guests up there in the mountains of, uh, of Dharamsala, uh, who, as I mentioned earlier, you can see has made a practice of returning to this motivation. So as you can see here, simply just linking one's life and everyday pursuits to wanting to do good in the world and wanting to benefit others, you can view that as a practice, as the Dalai Lama voices here. This is actually something I myself do 
all the time, just following his lead, just before I go into a meeting, before I, you know, answer an email, before I do any kind of work, just trying to return to this motivation that I hope whatever I'm going to do will help this person and will have a ripple effect and maybe even help others in some unexpected way. And just returning to that motivation is deeply nourishing. And I find just puts me in a space where I'm more ready and willing to be of service when needed. So again, treating purpose as a practice. And all the research, just to sum it, sum it up simply, is that this makes us more resilient, more adaptable as we find with these other pillars. So I think I'll skip over uh, another, there's another really interesting study, but in a nutshell, it's just showing that uh, having a purpose that relates to one's education and learning is not only important for learning outcomes, when you cultivate a sense of purpose, it has all of these positive ripple effects, even improving the grades that kids have from improving their sense of purpose. So there's a lot of interesting research in this area as well. So let me just end on a, a very short note about this Healthy Minds program that we've developed. So we took all of this, this model for well-being and we worked with some um, really world-class uh, design firms to create what's called the Healthy Minds program. Uh, despite the fact that we're a little nonprofit at the university, this was selected by the New York Times as one of their top three meditation apps, which was totally unexpected to us. So it's now been used by hundreds of thousands of people. And what the research is showing, because we and other groups, there's groups at MIT, New York University, Arizona, there's many universities that are now doing research on the Healthy Minds program. In a nutshell, it's showing that you can train your mind in just minutes a day, and this seems to have all of these real world benefits. So as you can see summarized here, this can decrease stress, reduce symptoms of depression, anxiety, increase our sense of connectedness, and these data is really just from a few weeks of training doing four or five minutes a day. So even very short, small times of practice really can, can make a pretty dramatic difference. The coolest study, and this is the, I'll kind of end on this note. This was with uh, 600 school employees, mostly teachers during the pandemic. And you can see here on the left that in one month, the teachers who did the training, and again, this was roughly four and a half minutes a day of practice, you can see that they there was a pretty dramatic improvement in this measure of depression, anxiety, and stress. That's basically what this measure on the left is looking at. And you can see here that even after one week, there's already a statistical, statistically significant difference. Just one week of doing this. And then this dotted line here in the middle four weeks, and then three months later, follow up, you can see the, um, the improvements, the benefits are still retained. There's some reversion, but there's, there's still quite a, a statistically significant improvement that is retained even at three months. So that was really heartening. And this was for, and just imagine, this is for teachers about a year into the pandemic. So the most stressed out group you can imagine. I mean, imagine being a teacher this was right when everything was in lockdown. It was totally difficult to manage. Teachers were, I'm sure, so overwhelmingly stressed. And this is when we did this study. So it was showing that even the busiest people who are, might be completely stressed out really can benefit the most from these practices. Another related study, it wasn't the same pool of data, showed that when teachers did this training before they started their teaching career, they were, they were six times more likely to still be teaching three years later. And that would translate into a threefold, more than a threefold return on investment. So if you're a school system or you're a company, you can just see that purely from a financial perspective, this just makes sense to include this training. You will literally save money, your, your, the turnover and retention of your employees, the engagement of your employees, so we're trying to gather data that will just show that this not only makes sense just because we care about people and want people to experience more well-being, but this makes sense from a financial perspective, from an organizational perspective. And we're very hopeful that, that after more and more data like this comes out, it'll just be you know, a no-brainer. It'll be like, why wouldn't you do this in your company, in your organization, in your school, or even in your family? It's just the data is going to be so overwhelming. 
So thank you so much. That brings me to the end here. Um, this is our little slogan that we oftentimes like to end with. And just to say, I really, really appreciate, I know this is uh, uh, a new field in India, but it's just really heartening to know that positive psychology is uh, getting a foothold in India. So I'm very, very um, happy to be with you all and that you are the kind of the pioneers kind of bringing this new field of science uh, into India. So thank you again so much for having me. Uh, thanks, Dr. Dahl, uh, for that very insightful talk. And there are a lot of uh, uh, interesting concepts that you brought up, including the concept of uh, well-being as a skill and, you know, how easy and, you know, how tangible uh, you made the entire concept. Um, I also enjoyed, uh, you know, how you explained the four pillars of well-being and how it all really adds up. Right? So, uh, especially the uh, linkage between awareness and uh, its implications of the experience of pain. And, you know, how uh, that pain is connected, um, you know, the feel connected bit and how it impacts health both on a physical as well as a mental uh, level. Um, you know, how you kind of translated the get curious uh, part also, you know, and how it can be learned as a skill and similarly for motivation yeah. or uh, staying motivated. So, uh, so really nice. And um, also about the Healthy Minds program, um, you know, the benefits are really astounding and something as uh, you know, kind of uh, small as spending five minutes uh, a day. Personally, I'm very motivated and uh, I'm going to start practicing it. Um, but at this point, I'd like to invite questions uh, from the audience. Um, so I think, uh, you know, if uh, questions you can uh, kind of type out in the Q&A box or in the chat box and we can take them up. Um, I don't know if you can unmute and speak, but feel free to please uh, write them in the Q&A section. Um, so I think while the questions come up, uh, Dr. Dahl, I have a question um, and I, I work in the corporate sector. So I'm very intrigued to know that how does one really promote a culture of well-being uh, at the workplace? And, you know, what are some of the things that you should focus on, you know, hybrid work settings, actually? Yeah, it's a great question. We do a lot of work um, in with organizations, including some work with some of the largest companies in the world. So we've had a lot of experience just you know, trying, I mean, asking, we've been asking ourselves that same question and over the past maybe five years or so have been um, learning what really works. My sense, I guess I would, you know, mention two things. One is, is the importance of linking well-being to important real world outcomes. So each organization is going to have the issues it's grappling with. Like I just, for example, the, the teacher, the study with teachers I just mentioned, um, employee retention is a huge issue for school systems in the United States, as an example. They have just really high turnover. They A lot of teachers quit, and it just is a huge cost to these school systems to have to constantly rehire and find new teaching teachers, and then the teachers get burned out. So that's just one example. Like, the, you know, in this case, retention is like maybe that issue. For another issue, for another organization, it might be something else. You know, it might be you know, it might be burnout, it might be employee engagement, it might be productivity or whatever. Um, so I think one thing is to find those things that the organization really cares about and the, the stakeholders in the organization really care about, and then talk about these principles and practices because in light of whatever those things might be. So the fact that we have this data now, we can go into a school system and we can, we can instead of talking about our science and well-being, we can start the conversation by talking about the things that they're interested in. And then we can say, and here's how the science of well-being can help. You know, you're experiencing, like, for example, like with that, uh, the work we've done with school teachers, we can see that not only can you train, we have this data that shows you can actually improve retention rates. And that in particular, what seems to be driving that is the sense of connectedness the teachers feel. So versus that sense of kind of social isolation versus feeling connected. And so we can kind of show them like, hey, look, you care about employee retention. This is something that can help. And we can even show how it helps. Like we're basically kind of giving the, so showing them the path forward so that they can actually benefit or improve those things. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and I think along, along with that is just a lot of kind of starting by listening, really kind of 
kind of starting the conversation with just trying to learn what is going on in a particular organization, what they're struggling with, what the opportunities they are. And then also I maybe might add um, the in that listening, also to orient not only to the problems, but to the strengths. I didn't mention it today, but there's a lot of interesting research showing that both as individuals and as organizations, when we tackle problems by orienting to our strengths, it's more effective than when we just focus wholly on the problems themselves. And that's where like values and purpose, the fourth of the four pillars can be really important. It's almost like kind of focusing on the strength you have rather than focusing on your weaknesses. So that can help, that can happen even at an organizational level. So a lot to say about this. And frankly, we're still figuring this out ourselves, but those are some of the things that we've learned. Sure. Thanks for that, uh, Dr. Dahl. And great way to position this whole piece, a piece in the organization and really link it to business KRAs and kind of drive it through that uh, route. Yeah. So, uh, great. So we have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we have the first question from uh, Juhi Dhar, who, uh, who's requesting you to elaborate a little bit on the Healthy Minds program. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, um, we teach the program in, in multiple ways. We have some live courses we teach, but the what I just showed you, most of the data that we have is based on the Healthy Minds program app, which is completely free. It's, you know, despite the fact that it's taken us millions of dollars to build it, we've decided to make it completely free. So in any of the, the app stores, both with Google and Apple app stores, you can download it completely for free. And it has thousands of pieces of content. Literally, I think it's like five or 6,000 different audio files are in, in the app. But basically, it's a guided step-by-step -step journey to learn about these four pillars of well-being. So there's short podcast-style lessons that are like five to seven minutes long. And then you do practices. So you get a taste of the different practices um, to learn and strengthen these skills. And, and we've built this also for research. So the scientific questions we have um, are kind of built into the app. So for example, if you do a practice, say um, you wanna just do a basic mindfulness practice, like which is one of the first ones that is taught in the program, you can choose the length of the practice from five minutes to 30 minutes. You can choose from a range of different speakers, but you can also choose to do it either as a sitting meditation or as an active meditation. So some people do the whole program never with sitting down to without ever sitting down to meditate. Like you could do this when you're commuting to work every morning. And a lot that's when a lot of people do it. And the research that we've done so far shows that actually people who do these active practices seem to benefit just as much as the people who do the formal sitting meditation. So at least for early stages of meditation, we haven't yet measured more long-term benefits, at least for the early stage, it seems to be equally beneficial to do active versus formal sitting meditation. So it's a very step-by-step. -step. It's meant to just make it very easy to take one small step every day to continue to learn and practice these skills. Sure. So you can check it. Yeah, you can check it out. It's totally free. You can just download it in any of the app stores. Just, just search for Healthy Minds program. All right. Uh, thanks for that. Um, we have one more question from Bhagyashri Kulkarni, um, and she says, uh, thank you, Dr. Dahl, for a wonderful session. Her question is, uh, working on well-being, uh, is it more reactive or proactive? Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's a great question, too. Um, I would say, really, it, it probably can, realistically, probably is going to be both. Um, I would say, ideally, you can train these skills when things are relatively smooth. So ideally, it's proactive, I would say. Um, and you can think of that as like building up your immune system before you actually find yourself in somewhere where you might catch catch a cold or catch some illness or thinking of like, you know, the, the pandemic. You want to build up your immune You don't want to wait until you're exposed to a virus to build up your immune system. You want to build it up first. So that when you're in the situation, your immune system is already strong. Basically, the same principle holds for mental and emotional well-being. You want to build up these capacities so they're there when you need them. That's the ideal. But realistically, you know, there's always going to be times where it is a bit more reactive, where you know you find yourself in that stressful situation. Maybe you forget all about these skills that you learned, 
And it's sort of in the moment, you're like, okay, I can see I'm, I'm getting angry or I'm getting, you know, overwhelmed by anxiety. Like for me, what prompted me to start meditating many years ago was, was anxiety and social anxiety. So when I was maybe 19 and I was just starting college, I, I had a phobia of public speaking, for example. Like I never would have, in a million years, would have chosen to do this kind of thing. So it's amazing to me that I still do a lot of public speaking. Um, but I started meditating at that time. So it was a, that was exactly what I did. Like I would notice that I was getting really anxious about, you know, having to give a talk in a class or going to a party and having to meet new friends. And I was learning these practices. So I would bring awareness into my body. Like I still remember being in a party and getting really anxious and just starting to do these practices, just bring awareness into my body. And it just would diffuse that kind of anxious energy. So I think we just do our best. I think at the end of the day, just do our best. It's ideal if we can kind of be proactive, but sometimes you just do the best that you can and it might be, might be a, a bit more reactive. So good question. Okay. So thanks for uh, sharing that uh, personal experience. And it's hard to imagine you <laughs> like that at 19. So um, yeah, great. Uh, so while maybe uh, we'll have a couple more questions, but one question that comes to mind, uh, my mind is that, um, you know, if a person is experiencing benefits uh, while pursuing a program like this, uh, you know, why do people kind of, uh, what kind of setbacks do people experience? Why do they give it up? And how, how does one stay focused on, keeping with it for a long time. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because um, you're right. A lot of people start practicing and and stop. Like, I, and I've I've heard you know for I've been teaching meditation for um, almost 20 years, and so I've heard many many people come up to me and they say, well, you know, I started I started meditating or I started learning these practices, but my mind was so distracted. I just so I just stopped. It's just you know, it's not for me. And for me, hearing that, um, it's it's like saying, well, I started to exercise, but I got tired. So I stopped. And it's like, of course, you get tired. Like if you weren't distracted, we wouldn't need to do these practices. So oftentimes, the things that people feel experience, and then they feel like, oh, they're failing at it, they're not good at it. And then they stop actually are signs of success. So for example, when you sit down to meditate and you, say you do something simple, like you just bring awareness to your breath, you're doing a mindful breathing practice. The first thing you're going to notice is that your mind gets distracted. When I started doing this, I would meditate for 20 minutes twice a day. And probably 19 minutes and 30 seconds of those 20 minutes, my mind was completely distracted. But noticing the distraction is actually a sign of the practice working. You're essentially creating links between networks in your brain that are going to support your long-term well-being. So even though it feels like failure, it's again, it's like being on the treadmill at a, at a um, you know, when you're working out and getting tired. It's a sign that you're actually strengthening your physical body. So that's one thing is just know that what feels like failure, and it might even feel unpleasant at times, like getting tired when working out feels unpleasant, but actually it's a sign that you're strengthening networks in your brain that will have a huge impact in your, in your life and well-being. The second thing I would say, that's more about the attitude. The second thing I would say is just do one simple thing each day. It literally could be a minute or three minutes or five minutes. Just pick something you can do that's doable. Ideally, link it to another activity. Like when I started meditating, I would do it first thing when I woke up. So it was just like a simple routine. But it could be you do it right before you go to bed or you do it after you're brushing your teeth. Just make it, link it to another stable routine and make it very simple. And then you can build on that and expand over time. Don't try to be, you know, super human from the beginning. Just take small steps, focus on a steady, consistent, small steps, and they'll make a big difference. Sure, sure. So great tips there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, we're almost uh, at the top of the hour and Sanya's uh, camera's back on. So uh, anything you'd like to say, Sanya? Uh, I, I would just want to add to the experience that Dr. Gotland shared because I had a similar experience when I had started meditating where I felt restless and distracted, but so I, I can uh, associate that feeling. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Great. 
Okay, so uh, we don't seem to have any uh, more questions on the Q&A box. Um, so I think we could possibly wrap up the session. Um, so I'd like to thank you again, uh, Dr. Dahl, for taking out time to address the participants and very insightful talk, very tangible, practical tips uh, that you shared on how uh, you know, one can really get into the practice of meditation and the benefits uh, that are likely to accrue. Uh, so thank you once again. Uh, thanks for joining. And uh, thanks everyone else for joining the session today. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been an honor to, to be with you all. I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you, Professor Cotland, for taking us through this beautiful journey of well-being. And I'm sure all the attendees have had a great learnings and take backs. So we are grateful for your availability despite the difference in the time zone. And we really appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Shalini, for sharing the session and bridging the gaps here with the audience and the speakers. And thank you all the attendees for being so enthusiastic listeners. I, on behalf of NPPA, appreciate and acknowledge your presence and attendance for the session and the day one of the conference. So uh, tomorrow's session, they begin at 9 a.m. And we look forward to have you all. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.